In our previous video, we learned how to construct the LU factorization of the matrix, but now I want to talk about why we would be interested in doing something in the first place. Consider the following problem. Suppose we have a system of equations where each equation is a matrix equation, AX equals B. So we have some AX equals B1, AX equals B2, all the way down to maybe say like some AX equals BP. So what if we have a system of linear matrix equations? Each, pro each equation itself is a linear system that would have to be solved. What if we have some sequence of this, right? Now, this one, this, this is like a sequence of equations where you have to solve this one, solve this one, solve this one. Um, we could solve all of these ones in isolation right here. They don't necessarily interact with each other. But be aware that the process of solving the first ones, you would row reduce A. Right, you could either find like the inverse of A, or we row reduce A as a matrix, what have you. That would give us B, and then we row reduce the next one to get B two, and then we all do, do all the way through here. Now it's going to be the exact same row operations involved in solving each and every one of them. So computationally, it might be more efficient to record the necessary row operations once and for all. And this is actually the case um, with um, with our. Now we've done we've done problems like this before. Like when we did the change of basis matrix, uh, we basically would we, we would connect B and C together because uh, we had all of these problems together. So we just kind of put C as one. Or when we do row uh, reduction to find the inverse of a matrix, the idea is we can put a lot of solutions right here. We can do that, and so you could think of it as like as A augment all of the Bs together. But it, from a computational point of view, since you have to do all the same row operations, you can simplify it using the LU factorization, for which this could be a cost savings benefit if you have a lot of these, um, a lot of these systems you have to solve, which could very be, well be a possibility. Um, so let's let's talk about how LU factorization could potentially be a cost savings device right here. So we have seen the convenience of solving an augmented matrix in echelon form, or when that matrix U is actually a square matrix, we would call this the upper triangular form, right? It's an upper triangular matrix. Um, and so when you, have a, when you have an echelon form or an upper triangular matrix, it turns out that back substitution saves the day. It's very easy to solve a system of equation that looks like Z equals 1, uh, uh, Y, say Y plus Z equals 0, x plus y minus z equals 2 or something like that. This would be a very simple system of equation to solve, right? We know automatically z equals 1. That would imply that y equals negative 1. And then putting negative 1 minus 1 right there, you're going to get x minus 2. You move it to the side, x equals 4. Very simply, we can solve this system equation because it's in this echelon form. That's why we like echelon form so much. Back substitution saves the day. Now, what if we were sort of the other way around? What if we were upside down echelon form, this chandelier form or something? If we had like x equals 4, and then we have x minus y equals 7, and we have x plus y plus 2z equals 0. What if you had something like this? Well, the fact that it's upside down echelon form doesn't make it any harder. It would be the exact same ease, right? It has all the benefits of echelon form, except your, your zero's in the wrong spot. So if your matrix was lower triangular instead of upper triangular, it would still be a very easy system to solve. So now enter the LU factorization. Suppose we have an LU factorization of A. A equals L times U, where L is a unit lower triangular matrix, and U is an echelon form, which is kind of like an upper triangular matrix if it were a square. Well, if we have to solve the equation AX equals B, then what we could first do is think of the following. Well, we'll let y equal the vector u times x, where x is a solution vector to the equation ax equals b. So if x is a solution vector, u times x will equal y. And so solving the equation ax equals b is equivalent to solving the equation lux equals b. But by matrix associativity, this would be lux equals b, but ux is equal to y. So what we end up seeing here is that if you want to solve the equation AX equals B and you have an LU factorization, what we can first do is we can solve first, we solve first the equation LY equals B, we solve for Y, and then second we solve the equation UX equals Y. So what we can do is to solve the equation AX equals B, we can solve two linear systems. 
ly equals b and ux equals y, which the benefit of doing two is that this one right here is an echelon form. This one is lower triangular, which is basically just as good as echelon form. And so we can solve two easy linear systems for the price of solving one harder one, perhaps, if we have this LU factorization. So let's demonstrate this. In the previous video, we computed an LU factorization for this matrix A, which is four by five. We found L and we found U right here. Uh, you can take a look at that video to see the details of that if you haven't seen it already. And be aware we were working mod 11 in this example. So let's solve the equation AX equals B when B is the vector one, two, three, four. It's like my favorite vector. So the first thing we have to do is we're gonna solve the equation LY equals B. So we're gonna take the lower triangular matrix on the left and we're gonna augment it with B right here. We wanna solve for this vector Y. Y is not gonna be the solution to AX equals B, it's an intermediate vector. So we solve this one and um, I'm gonna, I wanna go through the details of this to show you how simple this calculation is gonna be even when you're working like mod 11 right here. So because this is a lower triangular matrix, it's unit lower triangular, right? We have ones along the diagonals. In terms of solving it, we have to get rid of the numbers below. So we're gonna take row two minus nine times row one. Now, as so we're working on 11, minus nine is the same thing as plus two, right? So you're gonna get a two right here and you're gonna get two right there. So this next row turns into zero, one, zero, zero, four. Uh, then the next row, we wanna get rid of the one right here. So we're gonna take row three minus one, row one. That's pretty easy. Minus one, minus one. You're going to get a zero, the eight, one, zero is left alone. And then you get three minus one, which is two. And then for the last one, to get rid of the eight, uh, you're going to take row four minus eight times row one. If you want a smaller number, though, you can think of it as actually plus three, row one. So you add three, you add three. And so we're going to get zero, four, two, one stays the same and you get a seven. It's pretty simple. So in terms of row replacements, that's a pretty nice step. Uh, go to the next matrix right here. So now we have a one right here. We got to get rid of the eight and the four below it. So we're going to take row three minus eight row two. Or like I said, since we're working mod 11, we can do plus three row two. So we add a three. We're going to add a 12. Uh, so the zero and eight plus three is 11, which will give us a zero right here. You don't have to do anything to the next two columns. The last column you get, well, adding 12 is the same thing as adding one mod 11. So you're going to get a three, two plus one. And then to get rid of the four right here, we're going to take row, row four minus four times row two. So you get a minus four and then you're going to get a minus 16, uh, which again, working mod 11, uh, take subtracting 11 excuse me, subtracting 16 is the same thing as just subtracting a five. Uh, so seven minus five is a two. There you go. And so then we have to do one more replacement here, get rid of the two that's below the one. So we're gonna take row four minus two times row three. We got a minus two minus six. That gives you a negative four, which is the same thing as seven. And so with very little effort, we're able to solve this system of linear equations because it's in this lower triangular form. Notice what we've discovered here is that y equals the vector 1, 4, 3, and 7. All right, so we found this intermediate solution. We then are going to solve the system ux equals y. So we're going to augment the vector y we found just a moment ago, 1, 4, 3, 7. And now we have to solve it with this echelon form matrix. This will be a little bit more difficult because our diagonal entries are not necessarily 1. Here's our pivots. So we're going to have to do some scaling as well. Uh, to the row replacement. So the first thing to do is to divide uh, the fourth row by five. So five divided by five is a one. That's pretty easy. Uh, seven divided by five is a little bit more tricky, uh, but let's see if we add 11 to seven, we end up with 18. Uh, that's not quite good enough. Um, if we add 11 again, we'll get 29. Not quite there. If we go one more time, we add 11 again, that's gonna give us 40. 40 divided by five is gonna be eight. So we get an eight right here. So then we have to do row replacements. We gotta get rid of all these numbers right here. So we're gonna take row one, subtract from it nine times row four. Uh, again, for simplicity, I'm gonna add two times row four. So we're gonna get plus two plus 16. But if you take away 11 from that, that's just really just adding five. So we're gonna end up with a six, a zero and a six right there. So for the next one, we're gonna do row two 
subtract eight, which is the same thing as adding three times row four. So we're gonna add three, we're gonna add 24. Now 24, if you reduce that, mod 11 is actually just a two. You can take 22 away from that. Four plus two is equal to a six. So you're gonna get zero and six right there. And then for the next one, we're gonna just take row three, subtract row four. So you get a minus one, minus eight, uh, for which I'll give you a negative five, which is plus six. So you get a zero and a six right there. The row replacements are very minimal right here. And then we move our pivot to the next one here in the three, where is that? The three, four position. So we got rid of the numbers above it. Well, you can take row two minus row three. That's easy enough. Minus two minus six. Uh, oh, I guess I should scale it first. Let's scale it. I mean, that, that's okay what we were doing there, but let's scale it. So let's take one half times row three. You're going to take two divided by two, which is a one. And you're going to take six divided by two, which is a three. All right, that's just regular integers. Now, if we take row two, subtract two times row three, which is exactly what we had before, you're going to see that you got two minus two and then six minus six. Uh, so this is just going to be a bunch of zeros right there. To get rid of this five, we would take row one minus five times row three minus five. And then you're going to take three times five is 15, so negative 15. If you reduce that mod 11, that's actually a negative four. So six minus four is a two. Like So I like to reduce whenever I can. It makes the arithmetic simpler. I like small numbers. Uh, and so then the next pivot position, you're going to come over here. You're going to grab the three, divide this whole row by three. So one third row two. Three divided by three is a one. Um, all these are zeros, so that's going to just give you zero here. So we have to take one divided by four, excuse me, one divided by three. Got a little ahead of myself there. Uh, if you take one and you add 11 to that, that's 12 divided by three, which is, that's a four. So we put that number in right there. So to get rid of this four right here, this is our last step. We're going to take row one, subtract four times row two, um, for which, because these are zeros, we don't have to worry about anything there. We have a negative four. We're going to have a negative 16 right there. Which again, as we're working, uh, well, we'll we'll just we'll just add together. Ten minus sixteen is a negative six, and negative six. If you add eleven to that, as a five. So our the first row becomes two zero five zero zero two, and then you have to divide the first row by two. Uh, which two divided by two is a one. Two divided by two is a one. That's pretty easy. Then we have to deal with this five right here. Five divided by two. Again, I cheated there and saw my answer is going to be 8. Uh, but how do we get that? 5 divided by 2. Let's add 11 to 5. That gives us a 16 divided by 2. That's where the 8 came from. So you see an 8 right here. And let's see the whole thing. So we're going to get 1, 0, 8, 0, 1, 0, 1, 4, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 3, and 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 8. So pulling this apart, the general solution to this system of linear equations would look like x where you're gonna have x1 is gonna look like one minus eight x3. Then the next one's gonna look like zero minus four x3. Then the next one would be x3. Your free variable, right, is this non-pivot column that you see right here. Uh, then we get x4 equals three, and then x, x5, x4 was three, x5 is an eight. And so if you pull that apart, you're going to have this constant vector, 1, 0, 0, 3, 8. This is a particular solution to the system. Then you're going to get t times just the x3 part. You're going to get 0, 0 down there. A negative 8 is the same thing as 3. So if you prefer a positive, you can do that. Uh, a negative 4, you could write that as a 7. And then for you get a 1 right there. And so this gives you your general solution as is written right here. And this is the solution to the system of equations that we solved using the LU factorization. Now, why is the LU factorization so useful here? Now, if we go through and calculate the number of flops that we did with the LU factorization, flops here being our sort of fundamental uh, complexity measurement here. If you think about like how much effort would a computer have to put into solving this problem. If you count the number of flops um, with respect to the LU factorization, you turned out to get, uh, you, you, I think if I counted correctly, you had 27 flops along the way. Um, if you took the regular method, our original method where you didn't have the LU factorization, that turned out to be, I think it was like 46 flops. 
just counting things like multiplication and division, these basic arithmetic operations. And so you can see that the LU factorization takes almost about half of the effort to solve the system of equation than the original one, if you think about all the replacements that you might have to do, all the, all the flops you have to do. So LU factorization is a lot easier to solve in general. Uh, but, let's see, it's on the previous slide still. And, but there is a cost to computing the LU factorization. That's where we return back to this issue right here. That if you're just trying to solve one system of equation, the effort of computing LU, the LU factorization, and then solving it is going to be more than just solving the problem itself. But the thing is, if, when you start stacking this on, you have the sequence of linear systems you have to solve. Then it starts to become cost um, a cost opportunity that if we invest a little bit on the first problem to find the LU factorization and then solve each subsequent problem using the LU factorization, then at the end of this problem, we might have actually saved some time. So from a computational efficiency point of view, the LU factorization could help us simplify our calculations. And that's one of the reasons why we care about the LU factorization.